There's just a little bit more to read in the article. As I mentioned, one can go in and read the rest of the article. It's not much longer. But one gets the general gist of the article there, that perfect love for God inspires a perfect contrition for sin, which the Church has always said obtains the forgiveness of sins, all sins. Okay? But there's really no, no dispute about that. In the, for Catholics, anyway, there's no dispute about that for Catholics. Mm -hmm. I found it very interesting to look at the book of Father Leonard Feeney, The Bread of Life, just Bread of Life. It's actually a series of lectures of his that he gave in the 1930s, I believe, and he... This is, uh, unfortunately, a very confused and confusing book. If you look at what he wrote here, you see, I won't, again, read a great deal of it, but he does lapse into catechism question and answer mode a couple of times here, and he's asking himself these questions. On page 120, he starts out, what does baptism of desire mean? And he answers, it means the belief in the necessity of baptism of water for salvation and a full intent to receive it. So you see, he talks about a baptism of desire being essentially that, belief in the necessity of baptism water and the intent to receive it. Okay? Then he asks, can baptism of desire save you? And he answers, never. And he answer, asks, could baptism of desire save you if you really believed it could? He answers, it could not. Well, this is contrary to what the Council of Trent actually said, right? According to the very definition of baptism of desire that he himself gives, this is point blank, directly contradictory to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, published in 1566 by St. Pius V himself, on the baptism of adults. And he asks, could it possibly suffice for you to pass into a state of justification? He says, it could. Interesting enough, your sins are forgiven. If you got into the state of justification with the aid of baptism of desire, and then failed to receive baptism of desire, could you be saved? He answers, never. But he's not addressing the case at all of someone who was not baptized with water through no fault of his own. He intended to receive it. Okay, he says, never. In other words, under no circumstances, justified or not. Okay, so he seems to somehow draw a line between justification and sanctification. The Catholic Church herself recognizes the work of Christ in the soul. Justifying us of sin is actually also bringing us into the state of sanctification. But Father Feeney breaks the two of them apart, distinguishes these two, so you can be justified from sin, not be sanctified by grace. Okay? And evidently that's why he said, you can be justified by the explicit desire for baptism. But unless you actually uh, survive to be baptized with that water of baptism, you cannot be saved. He actually he refers to this in, in page 123 in the book. Suppose one of these catechumens dies before being baptized. That is where the seminary professor runs out of answers and has to make up confused ones. With the assistance of the Baltimore Catechism, the Catholic Encyclopedia, and a few articles by some hitherto brilliant unknowns in the American Ecclesiastical Review. The paragraph in the Catholic Encyclopedia, which I just read, by the way, on the allowability of baptism of desire, is one of the most sneaky pieces of surreptitious theology ever placed in print. And he goes on to criticize that, and he criticizes the mentioning of St. Ambrose. He says, any simple and loving Catholic would understand St. Ambrose to have meant by this comfort that he hoped Valentinian had been baptized by somebody, even though he, St. Ambrose, did not know who it was, and even though there was no official record of it. Because if the grace Valentinian desired was something other than baptism of water, why call him a catechumen? Now, again, Father Fini gets really murky in his thinking here. When he, he's interpreting, or uh, twisting, I'd say, the words of St. Ambrose, just when St. Ambrose says, did he not get what he desired? Well, St. Ambrose is clearly referring to the grace of justification from sin, 
and sanctifying grace. Father Feeney is insisting that what Ambrose means, and Ambrose means is, did he not get what he desired, meaning baptism? Of course, he must have been baptized. That's what he desired. That's what St. Ambrose means. St. Ambrose hoping that, that he really got himself baptized somehow before he died, without anybody knowing about it, maybe without even himself knowing about it. Because Valentinian and St. Ambrose both regarded him as a catechumen, not yet baptized, right? So, uh, it's, it's a strange way of thinking on Father Pini's part, and I'd say it really does violence, certainly, to the meaning of the words here. And again, I mean, you know, this is a horse that's been beaten to death many times, I'm afraid. But I think the convoluted thinking of Father Pini helps to explain why he was summoned to Rome to explain his thinking, because his thinking was very mixed up. On page 137, he actually goes through the same process of questions and answers, okay? And again, I think it's very revealing of his thought process here, which is very, very, well, uh, troubling and convoluted. He says on page 137, can anyone now be saved without baptism of water? Answer, no one can be saved without baptism of water. Question, are the souls of those who die in the state of justification saved? If they have not received baptism of water? Answer, no, they are not saved. So you see, this is picking up where he kind of left off before. And baptism of desire can justify you from sin, but you, you won't be saved anyway. And so he picks up there. So someone asks here, well, actually, Father Feeney is asking himself, where do these souls go if they die in the state of justification, but have not received baptism of water? Answer, I do not know. Question, do they go to hell? Answer, no. Question, do they go to heaven? Answer, no. Question, are there any such souls? Answer, I do not know, neither do you. Question, what are we to say to those who believe there are such souls? Answer, we must say to them that they are making reason prevail over faith and the laws of probability over the providence of God. But actually, it's, it's Father Feeney who's doing that. He's the one who's actually guilty of that. First of all, you know, what he's implying is that there's another state, ultimately, where his soul winds up, that is not hell and, and not hell. Not purgatory, right? That doesn't even interfactor in anywhere. He calls limbo as part of hell, as the creed itself does, right? Hell without the punishment of the fire. So he seems to be postulating a hitherto unknown state of the soul, certainly unknown to Catholicism. And as I say, this, this man is um, really mixed up, and he's mixing people up by what he's saying here, that they're justified not, uh, but not sanctified, and they, if they die, they don't go to hell, and no, they don't go to heaven. And he doesn't know where they go. He has no idea where they go, and nobody does. Nobody knows where they go. This is what he's saying. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a very mixed up, he's not talking at a, as a Catholic theologian here. But let me just continue and say what he says after that on page 137. May I pause here, he says, to declare that I think both with regard to the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of penance, that the liberal theologians, when it suits them, are making perfect active love for God altogether too easy for a fallen nature like ours. I'm not going to think it as difficult for a Catholic who has fallen into mortal sin, but who through his faith remembers his holy communions, his blessed mother, his past sins, God's rich forgiveness in the sacraments to make an act of perfect love as for a catechumen who has not yet had the benefit of one of God's sanctifying sacraments. But the very... But the very fact that the church requires every mortal sin committed to be confessed, whether one is perfectly sorry for it or not, shows the church has a maternal suspicion of this perfect act of love for God, obtaining forgiveness apart from the sacrament of forgiveness instituted by Christ. So here he's calling into question the idea of the perfect act of love for God, the perfect contrition, having true uh, for, you know, power of remission of sins. And so this is, uh, you know, he's getting into murky waters because 
He's ha he has a knee-jerk reaction about the liberal, the liberal teaching, and he goes to the other extreme of their so liberalizing the baptism of desire as to make the desire basically unidentifiable, undetectable, and irrelevant almost, and, and taking the position, as he does, that there's no such thing as a baptism of desire, period, that can actually avail you to justification and grace, as the Council of Trent says. So what he accuses the liberals of doing, he is doing in the other direction, okay? In a sense, he's as liberal as they are, because he's actually denying the, the stated words of the Church in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. He even says in another place, and I won't quote that, but he even says that even, even if somebody could be justified by the baptism of desire, he can't hold it. You know, two or three days, he's bound to commit a mortal sin. He's bound to sin again. And of course, that in itself is allowing reason to prevail over, over grace. Because obviously, if God were to give the grace to someone to desire the sacrament of baptism, and to repent of his sins and have, again, uh, justification from sin. If God could give that grace to someone, God could preserve that soul from mortal sin by grace as well. Mm -hmm. So it gets to the point where you're reading the book, uh, the, these thoughts of Father Feeney, and you're, you wind up kind of scratching your head and you're wondering, boy, he's making all these suppositions. And then he's accusing his adversaries of making all the suppositions. And as I say, it's, uh, it's no wonder that he was summoned to Rome to explain himself, but he refused to go because, as he explained it, the cards were stacked against him. That is, you know, he was already said to be condemned. And again, I think that's the greatest condemnation there is against him that he wouldn't go because he was summoned to explain himself. And that was a great opportunity if he really believed that what he was saying was true. But, um, you know, when, when, when you read what he writes here, you, you, you get to be as confused as he was, mm -hmm. as confused as those who picked up the theme, you know, denying the existence of baptism of desire and baptism of blood, which were very uh, readily believed in by fathers of the church. Mm -hmm. But those who deny a baptism of desire and baptism of blood now, what they, what they stand on, actually, is no salvation outside the church. They actually trick you into as though you're, you're actually talking about and discussing the question of baptism of desire and baptism of blood, the reality of these things, the nature of these things, the true Catholic teaching on these things. And they immediately, at some point, switch tracks over to no salvation outside the church and try to make it sound as though that's what you're denying when you uphold the baptism of desire and baptism of blood. But of course, you're not denying that. Again, the liberals make it sound that way, but it is, again, a, um, a, a logical trick to try to paint you into the corner when all you're trying to do is express the real Catholic teaching on these, these subjects.